Good morning. Welcome to our class this morning. We're continuing our look at spiritual warfare. This is lesson 6A. Uh, if you're going by the Secret of the Christian Spiritual Life series, this would be lessons 21 and 22. I post them on YouTube on, in both of the playlists uh, so people can stay with the, the uh, spiritual life lessons and they can also those who just joined for spiritual warfare have their own list so uh, my caveat this morning we've had very windy weather uh, this week and uh, lost electricity for several hours yesterday we may lose it this morning though it's not real bad this morning if we do lose uh, power and i go off the air then uh, wait about five minutes that'll give us time to get the uh, emergency generator going and get uh, hooked back up, and you should be able to log in then. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Father Yahweh, we are so grateful for your word. We're grateful, most of all, for the love you have given your son to us in. We thank you for that love. We thank you for the word that expresses that love and teaches us your eternal purpose. As we study your eternal purpose, we are faced with spiritual warfare, and we are cognizant of our our role in teaching the heavenly realm, your magnificent and manifold purpose, manifold wisdom that you have provided for us in the mind of Christ. Therefore, we study the mind of Christ so that we might better serve our purpose and thereby serve you and demonstrate our love and devotion to you. We ask that you bless this study as we as we look into these things, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me go ahead and jump right to the slides because I get right into it immediately. Dr. Michael Heiser has announced his approaching physical demise. He has been a major source for my studies in the unseen realm in the book of Revelation and in our spiritual warfare classes. In honor of him, I'm concluding our angelic conflict sessions with extensive quotations from his last book, Demons, What the Bible Really Says About the Powers of Darkness. I have the Kindle version of that book, uh, very inexpensive and an excellent book, 400 and some pages. Uh, I'm not going to give it all to you today. I've just picked out some uh, relevant topics, some topics that I thought would be interesting, topics that will answer some questions that people have. Here is Dr. Heiser's uh, announced... Oh, what happened to it? What happened to it? You have it in your notes. <laughs> Somehow it got left out of the slides or it disappeared in the slides. Okay. Well, um, if you may hand me your notes, I'll go ahead and read that. Because I think it's a great testimony. He's written... He is the man for uh, the unseen realm. Uh, he's written several books, uh, the, the most scholarly. He's, he's a scholar. He's a PhD in a couple of areas, languages and Old Testament and so on. Um, but he's the one that has that really uh, developed the uh, all of the angelic stuff that we have looked into in our various studies. Uh, here's what he says. I am at the end of the road in the late stage four of a very aggressive pancreatic cancer. Nothing to date has reversed the tumor status. It has now invaded the upper GI and stomach areas, causing slow, uncontrollable bleeding. No one on my medical team has a solution or knows of one. During the latest endoscopy, an effort was made to cauterize as many of the bleeding points as possible to at least slow the bleeding. In essence, I am bleeding out at a slow rate with no solution. As you all know, when I pass, I will join the family of God and his counsel, to which all of us as believers presently belong, but not yet, in its fullness. This is what awaits me, and I am glad. We will see each other in the future in unimaginably glorious ways, he explained. Or he, uh, this author, the article commented that. I know this news is depressing, but you should all know I will die happy, to have served the Lord and you all in the ways I have. God has been very good to us, gifting me in discernible ways, and I think just as importantly, given me heart for the lay community, all of you. 
I desired nothing more than to empower all of you to study scripture more deeply, to unlock the Bible for you, for yourselves in ways inaccessible to all but scholars. This brought me special joy. And then the uh, author of the article that I pulled this from said, what could be a better ending to a life spent in service of the Lord than passing on with the joy of the Lord in one's heart? I've read that about 20 times so that I would be able to do it without, uh, without crying this time, but even that was difficult. So uh, yeah, if you do a search for Michael Heiser, he has uh, just innumerable uh, discussions online. Uh, I think he has what he calls the Naked Bible Broadcast, where he's asked questions by an interviewer, uh, and he has, I, I don't know, I think maybe hundreds of those broadcasts. He is a scholar, so some of his stuff is technical, but he does have some uh, books that are not so technical, and I recommend them, Demons, uh, the ones we're looking at, uh, the, the ones we're taking quotes from today, is called Demons, and it's not real scholarly. It does have about four or five hundred uh, footnotes or, or uh, references in the bibliography, uh, but it's written more for the lay person. Uh, Unseen Realm is definitely scholarly, uh, but he has another one that is uh, not so scholarly that covers the same material, but without nearly as many references. Okay, we're going to start with uh, the origin of demons. This is page two of your notes, uh, and it's subtitled Bastard Spirits. Uh, as the Watcher's Saga continues in First Enoch, remember we studied the book of Enoch, uh, the four archangels, Michael, Sariel, Raphael, and Gabriel, uh, report the travesty unfolding on earth to the Most High. This is First Enoch 9, and this is the, uh, what's going on in Genesis 6 is the, the context for their report. God responds by decreeing the coming of the flood and ordering the offending watchers to be rounded up for judgment in the abyss. And to Gabriel, he, God, said, Go, Gabriel, to the bastards, to the half-breeds, to the sons of miscegenation, and destroy the sons of the watchers from among the sons of men. Send them against one another in a war of destruction. And the length of days they will not have, and no petition will be granted to their fathers in their behalf, that they should expect to live an eternal life, nor even that each of them should live 500 years. And to Michael, he said, go, Michael, bind Shemihaza and the others with him who have united themselves with the daughters of men so that they were defiled by them in their uncleanness. And when their sons perish and they see the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them for 70 generations in the valleys of the earth until the day of their judgment and consummation, until the eternal judgment is consummated. Then they will be led away to the fiery abyss and to the torture and to the prison where they will be confined forever. These, of course, are the Nephilim uh, that we're talking about. These are the offspring of Shemihaza and the others and uh, who defiled the women, human women, uh, in their uncleanness. The language of this passage and others is the conceptual source of statements in the letters of Peter and Jude, and we've looked at those in our prior studies, regarding the angels who sinned at the time of the flood being sent to Tartarus and chained in gloomy darkness. Sullivan, one of the authors he uh, quotes, notes, because the hybrid offspring were conceived on earth, their spirits were doomed to remain there. The conduct of these watchers was significantly evil. The watchers are the fall, what we call the fallen angels, okay? The angels that left their first estate and cohabited with the human women. The conduct of these watchers was significantly evil as to cause them and their hybrid offspring to be barred from heaven. But Enoch's retelling of the divine rebellion in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 doesn't end there. In Enoch 15, we learn that this episode is at the core of Jewish demonology. God, speaking to Enoch, says, 
go and say to the watchers of heaven, who sent you to petition in their behalf? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go and say to the watchers of heaven who sent you to petition in their behalf. Remember in our previous study, when we looked at the book of Enoch, the watchers, the fallen angels asked Enoch because he was favored by God to go to them and petition God on their behalf. So he says, who sent you to, who, who sent you in, to petition in their behalf? Uh, quote, you should petition in behalf of men and not men in behalf of you, is his reply to the watchers. Why have you forsaken the high heaven, the eternal sanctuary, and lain with women, and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, and taken for yourselves wives, and done as the sons of the earth, and begotten for yourselves sons, giants? So this, as you remember, was a big source of the Nephilim, uh, information and a big source of the information about the giants, the, the mighty ones. But now the giants who were begotten by the spirits and flesh, they will call them evil spirits upon the earth, for their dwelling will be upon the earth. Okay, so where are the evil spirits who are the departed spirits of the Nephilim? On the earth. The spirits that have gone forth from the body of their flesh are evil spirits, for from humans they came into being, and from the holy watchers was the origin of their creation. Evil spirits they will be on the earth, and evil spirits they will be called. The spirits of heaven, and heaven is their dwelling, but the spirits begotten in the earth, on earth is their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants lead astray, do violence, make desolate, and attack and wrestle and hurl upon the earth, and cause illnesses. They eat nothing but abstain from food and are thirsty and smite. These spirits will rise up against the sons of men and against the women, for they have come forth from them. So here, pretty, pretty good definition of what demons do. Uh, they, uh, they lead astray. They do violence. They make desolate. They attack and wrestle and hurl upon the earth and cause illnesses. Uh, they eat nothing but abstain from food and are thirsty, and they smite. The origin of demons is tied specifically to the incident of the Watchers in Genesis 6. Reed summarizes the theology of Second Temple Judaism. Second Temple Judaism is the period between the completion of the Old Testament canon and the New Testament canon, or actually the uh, time of Jesus on the earth. That's the Second Temple period. It goes into really most of the first century uh, as, as part of that Second Temple period. So from the, the end of the Old Testament until about the time of the Revelation, that is the writing of the Revelation, that's Second Temple Judaism. The birth of the giants is explored in terms of the mingling of spirits and flesh. Angels properly dwell in heaven and humans properly dwell on earth, but the nature of the giants is mixed. This transgression of categories brings terrible results. After their physical death, the giants' demonic spirits come forth from their bodies to plague mankind. This passage from 1st Enoch is not unique. Other Second Temple Jewish texts that affirm the supernatural perspective of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and the origin of demons via the Nephilim, Stuckenbruck notes a number of early Jewish traditions regarded these beings as essentially evil, representative of forces that are inimical to, uh, inimical to God, uh, to God's original purpose for creation. For example, the book of Jubilees has demons fathered by the watchers. As we saw earlier in our study, demons, the spirits of the giants, operate under divine permission and therefore exist as contained powers whose defeat is assured. The Dead Sea Scrolls offer other examples. Thomas identifies numerous texts among the Dead Sea Scrolls that exhibit familiarity with watchers and the giant traditions. Certain scrolls refer to demonic powers as bastard spirits, the Ruhat Mamzerim, uh, precisely because it was presumed that demons were the disembodied watcher spirits of the Nephilim giants. Thomas further draws attention to the Qumran scrolls 
that contain incantation against evil spirits and suggest even seem to presume the idea that the spirits of the giants continued to plague humanity even after the flood. They, the spirits were not destroyed by the flood. Demons were not destroyed by the flood. In a related sectarian exorcistic text in 4th Qumran 444, Mamzarim are mentioned in juxtaposition or apposition perhaps to a spirit of impurity, which may help to clar clarify the sense of bastards. The Genesis Apocryphon from Qumran is also illustrative as to the prevalence of the Watcher Nephilim tradition. This text, dated sometime between the first centuries uh, BC and AD, uh, is famous for being one of the first Dead Sea Scrolls published and for its rewriting of events included in Genesis, most notably the circumstances of Noah's birth, where Noah's mother is queried by, by Lamech, uh, his father, as to whether she was impregnated by a watcher. You'll remember as we study, there was a mysterious, a mysterious uh, passage that said uh, the earth uh, contained the Nephilim and even after those days. My theory is that it was not uh, Noah's wife who was impregnated, but one of their son's wives who was impregnated uh, or perhaps something to that. That's the only way I can figure that, that, the, that the demons, the, the Nephilim continued on after the flood, uh, unless they were really good swimmers. Thomas observes thusly, watchers and giants are intimately associated in early Jewish Aramaic literature with the story of flood of Noah and the flood, which in turn is complexly related to older Mesopotamian lore about Gilgamesh and Upnashitim. Um, I'm sorry, Upnapishtim. Upnapishtim. Uh, Upnapishtim. Uh, of course, Mesot Mesopotamian area, of course, the area around uh, uh, present day Iraq uh, and the ancient home of. Uh, well, there were several famous cities in that area, as we've studied in the past, uh, but those were the areas where these, these uh, what were called myths or, or uh, reports about Gilgamesh and Utnapishtim uh, were written, and there is quite a bit of similarity. Uh, if you ever study this, you'll see that a great, a great deal of this Mesopotamian literature is copied from the Bible and uh, it kind of turns it around for their gods as opposed to the God. The author of the Book of Giants, for instance, likely understood Gil Gilgamesh and Hobabish, uh, or Humbaba, uh, and perhaps Atambish or Utnapishtim, uh, to be figures who are in fact giants themselves, which might help to explain the point made rather defiantly in the Qumran birth of Noah materials that we just talked about, that despite any, excuse me, recognizable affinities with the hoary Mesopotamian heroes, Noah was not the offspring of the watchers, even in light of the aberrant circumstances of his birth. Second Temple Jewish literature thus presents us with a matrix of ideas with respect to evil spirits. The corporate divine rebellion of Genesis 6 was a horrific event aimed at the destruction of the people of God and humanity at large. The fallen sons of God, the Watchers, corrupted humanity and turned them toward idolatry. The Nephilim and their descendants wreaked physical destruction and through their disembodied spirits, ongoing physical and spiritual devastation. Wright summarizes the theological point. The giants of the watcher tradition are described as spiritual beings that were born with a human type of body. The giants are seen as categorically evil because they are an illegitimate mixed nature of human and angel. Their function in the physical world of first Enoch was to destroy humanity. Following their death, their purpose as evil spirits was to tempt humans and to draw them away from God. 
Early Christian writers were also aware of and embraced this reading of the pre-flood Sons of God Watchers episode. Stuckenbrook offers examples. In particular, we see the Christian Testament of Solomon in 5.3 within the section of 5.1 through 11. The author reinterprets the demon Asmodeus. This is a deliberate reference to the book of Tobit, uh, which was not chosen to be a part of the canon, which follows the longer recension, Codex Sinaiticus, uh, one born from a human mother and an angel. So the literature is rife with this repeated uh, definition of demons as being the offspring of human women and angelic or spirit kind beings. In the latter text, the demonic power thwarted by Jesus, Mark 5, 3, is identified as one of the giants who died in the internecine conflicts. Similarly, in the pseudo-Clementine homilies, that refers to giants, which are designated as both bastards and demons in the antediluvian phase of their existence. Here they are said to have survived uh, the deluge in the form of disembodied large souls whose post-diluvian activities were proscribed through a certain righteous law given them through an angel. That would have been Michael or Gabriel. Furthermore, one may consider to Tertullian's apology a passage deserving more detailed analysis in which the offspring of the fallen angels are called a demon brood who inflict upon our bodies diseases and other grievous calamities. Tertullian, of course, is a, one of the church fathers. In the instructions by the third century North African bishop uh, Commodianus, the disembodied existence of the giants after their death is linked to the subversion of many bodies. The implication of the giant tradition for con concepts of demonology at the turn of the common era, what we call AD, have until now been insufficiently recognized. We have seen how the narrative elements, divine beings cohabiting with mortal women and producing giants, are consistent across the material from Mesopotamian, the Hebrew Bible, and Second Temple texts. But what about this last item, the evil spirits, the Abkalu? Uh, are, were cultural heroes to the pagans. Were they also considered demonic? Is there an association in the Old Testament between the giants and evil spirits? Readers will recall that the answer to both these questions is yes. We saw earlier that the Apkalu were exiled from the presence of the high gods for their deed, sent back to the abyss permanently by Marduk. Marduk being one of the pagan gods. They were also considered evil in Mesopotamian religion. It is a little known fact that the Apkalu are occasionally depicted as malevolent beings in Mesopotamian literature who either angered the gods with their hubris or practiced witchcraft. The Apkalus occur at least twice in the anti-witchcraft -witch series Maglui as witches against whom incantations are directed. The fact that Apkalu are born and often reside in Apsu is not evidence that points to their exclusively positive character, since demonic creatures were also often thought to have their origin in the depths of the divine river Apsu. And you'll remember that Tartarus is, uh, uh, that certain fallen angels are held under the uh, Mesopotamian rivers. In like manner, our discussion of the Rephaim in chapter one, which we did not cover, revealed that the Old Testament not only used the term giants descended from the Nephilim, but also had Rephaim as underworld inhabitants. That was a actual, uh, actually found in the Old Testament that the Rephaim are inhabitants of the underworld, the world of the dead, the world of the, of the judged. Whereas the Rephaim in the literature and religion of ancient Ugarit were only underworld inhabitants, the disembodied spirits of warrior kings and not giants, the Old Testament puts forth both ideas. This is because Ugaritic literature lacked a corporate divine rebellion story comparable to Genesis 6, itself a polemic response to the Babylonian Apkalu traditions. Second Temple Jewish writers had a literary relationship to Babylonian material, not Ugaritic texts, 
because of the exile in Babylon, where the where the prophets were exiled uh, when uh, during the Babylonian captivity. So, but the Ugaritic texts parallel the, the texts in the Old Testament and in the extra biblical literature of Enoch and uh, Solomon and others. Summary. To this point in our study, we have seen that the Second Temple Jewish theology of the powers of darkness draws on the Old Testament and its wider ancient uh, near, uh, near Eastern context. Evil powers are present in the world because of an initial divine rebellion in Eden and a subsequent corporate rebellion at the time of the flood. In both instances, Second Temple writers connect data points found, in, found scattered in the Old Testament. The effect is that one can both see the coherence of connect, connections and the portraits that emerge from them and the creative development of a theology of evil spirits. Okay, so where do the evil spirits come from? Where do demons come from? They are the departed spirits of the Nephilim. There are two theories about the source of, the, of, of demons. One is that they are the evil spirits of pre-Adamite beings, the pre-Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, or during the verse 2 of Genesis 1, during the gap, during the time when the earth became formless and void as part of the judgment on the spirit beings. That uh, is a widely held belief. Uh, I'm not going to choose one or the other. Uh, I think probably uh, there, uh, there's truth to both of them, that some of these uh, evil spirits, demon spirits, may be pre-Adamite beings that dwelt on the earth during the time of Satan's reign uh, before his fall. Uh, and some of the evil spirits are demon spirits from the Nephilim. So let's, uh, let's leave it at that for now. Okay, now uh, on page eight of your notes, you have this, demons are fallen angels. Uh, this is in the questions and myth section of Dr. Heiser's uh, book on demons. And he says, this notion is ubiquitous in popular Christian books and preaching. It is both on target and misguided. The statement fails to account for a number of items in the biblical text and the development of biblical thought about the powers of darkness. As we noted early in our study, the Old Testament angel is a functional, not an ontological term. It's not a defini definition of who they are. It's a definition of what they do. They're messengers. Remember, we covered that uh, in our Revelation series, that it's functional, not ontological. It is, in effect, a job description. However, you'll see this circumstance changes in the Second Temple period and the New Testament where angel is a term used predominantly to distinguish loyal supernatural beings from evil rebellious ones. The devil, Satan, can have angels, quote unquote, on his side, Matthew 25 and Revelation 12, 9, which in the totality of good versus evil would mean that demons, part of Satan's kingdom, can be considered fallen angels. They... They're not. They, they are evil uh, beings, but they're not, they're not really, the fallen angels do not become demons. The offspring of fallen angels have become demons, of course, as we saw. Nevertheless, demons are consistently cast as disembodied spirits of dead Nephilim and their giant clan descendants. These spirits are the offspring of the angels that sinned before the flood. So the demons cannot be those fallen angels. Consequently, while a term like fallen angels may be used correctly in discussing demons, it is too often used simplistically and inaccurately. They're not to be referred to as fallen angels. That's a separate category of being. This problem came about because of the change from... Uh, 
Hebrew to Greek in the translation of the Septuagint, where in the Greek there was no, no corollary terms for Old Testament Hebrew terms for the spirit beings. I left that whole section out because it's quite, quite scholarly and very detailed and uh, more than you need to know since we have this information. But uh, uh, fallen angels are not demons. Uh, that comes from a change in language. Uh, angelos was a word, a Greek word, that uh, a lot of the translate, translators of, in, of the Hebrew into the Septuagint chose to use because they had no other. They had no, no corollary to the Hebrew terms for the fallen angels and the spirit beings in the Old Testament. So that's, that's why we have to do the scholarly stuff and look at Second Temple literature and original Hebrew literature to see exactly where they were. All right. Now, here's another question that arises. Can Satan and evil spirits be redeemed? Uh, he says, I have addressed this question in detail elsewhere. Uh, briefly, an offer of redemption to the supernatural rebels, Satan, and the offending sons of God of Genesis 6, <clears throat> sorry, and the cosmic geographical ruling sons of God, the ones who are hostile to Yahuwah, is explicitly denied in Scripture. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So they obviously are not part of those who are to inherit salvation. So they are ministering spirits to those who inherit salvation. So that would be an indication that, no, there is no future redemption for them. The implication of these words is clear in light of the link between the incarnation of the Son as a human and the offer of salvation put forth in Hebrews 2. The plan of salvation is focused on human beings because human beings were the original object of eternal life in God's presence on earth. Angels were not the focus because the fall disrupted an earthly enterprise. Remember, the whole purpose of the creation of humankind was to resolve the spirit kind rebellion. Satan's appeal that God could not cast him and his minions into the lake of fire and be fair, be a fair and just God. So God created humans, a creature lower than the angels, with one thing in common with the angels, free will. Free will. The ability to choose. The angels, led by Satan, chose against God. Humans get the opportunity to choose for God. It appears that probably when an equal number of humans choose for God as the number of angels or fallen spirit beings chose against God, that that will be the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Remember, the Gentiles are the heavenly realm. That's us, the body of Christ. We are the heavenly uh, realm for God. The Jews will rule on the earth. We will rule in heaven. Therefore, there has to be a number of Gentiles who come in that can match the number of demons. This is another theory. I'm not saying that it's absolutely true, but it appears to be. So uh, we will actually be part of that fullness of the Gentiles that will resolve the angelic conflict or the spirit kind rebellion. Okay, But it's earthly, humans. And this, of course, immediately negates anything said by the Calvinists. Because the Calvinists say human beings do not have free will. And free will is the entire issue for humans because it was the entire issue for the spirit kind, for the angels. So obviously humans have free will despite what Calvin said. Okay, So 
watch out for Calvin. As Lewis Berry Chafer says, when you come in contact with a Calvinist, do not discuss with him, just leave. God's human imagers, that's us, were corrupted, left estranged from God, left unfit to live in God's presence. In the end, it will be human beings who will share authority with Christ in ruling the new earth, not the angels. The angels will not be ruling. They will be ruled. That's why we are called the sons of God. Remember the uh, uh, heavenly council? We're called the sons of God. The, the spirit kind beings were called the sons of God. And now we are called the sons of God because we will replace them in the angelic or divine, I should say, divine council. Angels will not be ruling in heaven. Human believers will be in heaven ruling. All right. You're going to skip now from page 10 in your notes to page 17. I ended up with too much material, so I'm going to place the page halfway through page 10 through page 16. I'm going to place that at the end, so if we have time, we will be able to cover it, but these other, uh, other topics, I think, are more pertinent, more important, so just lay aside your, those notes uh, for now and move to page 17. Can they read our minds? It should be the topic at a almost the center of your page. Is that correct? Okay. Can Satan and demons read our minds? This is a question that I've heard numerous times. And uh, so I included it in our study today. <clears throat> Let's see if I can clear this frog. There is no scriptural evidence that members of the heavenly host know a person's mind or thoughts the way God does. The question usually arises from presumptions we have about consciousness and its relationship to supernatural beings. The fact that angels appear to people in dreams and visions, Matthew and Acts, seems to suggest that supernatural beings can tap into one's mind. The assumption is that since evil spirits are fallen angels, see that earlier discussion on that language, then Satan and demons have the ability to occupy space, so to speak, in the human mind. That angels in the New Testament instructed people through such means is not evidence of mind reading. If anything, such incidents describe the transmission of information, not the reading of minds. Such incidents could, of course, influence human behavior, and might conceivably be a line of demonic oppression. And I think it is a line of demonic oppression. Uh, you'll hear lots of testimonies of uh, saved and unsaved people who talk about the demons coming to them in dreams and visions, and it resulted in their worshiping of Satan and, and getting into witchcraft and so on. So it is a line of demonic oppression, I believe, that they, they, they cannot, there, there is evidence that they cannot demonize you without your permission. And people uh, who have these visions and dreams uh, become invitees, uh, inviters of, of the demons. Uh, so I think that's how they become demonically oppressed. That said, there are no scriptural examples of Satan or an evil spirit appearing to someone in a dream. All angelic dream sequences are of God's chosen angels, his called angels, his elect angels. As such, it is impossible to make a scriptural argument for a demonic invasion of the mind of the sort that would facilitate mind reading or demonization. An appeal to seeing or interacting with demonic entities in dreams or other altered states of consciousness, such as drugs, witchcraft, pharmacia, as we've seen, of consciousness can teach us nothing about the ontology 
of those entities until consciousness is better understood. The approach is based on speculation. Yeah, here's a correl correlative uh, statement, uh, question I should say. Um, this one is quite controversial. It's the reason that we're going to have it in our study. Can a Christian be demon possessed? Christian writers have taken both sides of this issue. The disagreement in part derives from semantics, but that is not to imply that the debate lacks substance. The semantic problem derives from English translations of the Greek lemmas, the Greek words, in passages describing demonized individuals. Words like possess or possession denote ownership. A close reading of the New Testament ought to make it clear that a member of the body of Christ cannot be owned by Satan or demons. The body of Christ, the church, has been, quote, obtained with his own blood, Acts 20, the, the spirit, Romans 8, 9, and Christ, Colossians 1, 27, dwell within those who believe. Those who are in Christ have a new identity as members of the family of God, Galatians 3. Believers have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. We are God's inheritance. You cannot be possessed or owned by a demon if you are truly God's child, God's inheritance, the true believer. The idea that believers described in these ways can be subsequently owned by lesser demonic powers is incoherent. Arnold's observations are significant in this regard. The word possession never even appears in the Bible in the passages where Jesus or the apostles cast evil spirits out of an individual. No one in the Bible is said to be demon-possessed. The expression demon-possessed or demon-possession does occur in some English translations of the Greek text, but there is never a Greek word for possession that stands behind that translation. Demon possession is always the translation of a single Greek word, daimonizomai, or daimonizomai, depending on your version of uh, uh, Greek rendering. Words for ownership or possession, such as huparko, echo, kateko, uh, kataomai, or peripoeo, are absent in the original text. The expression, he has a demon, eke daimonion, does appear in the Gospels. But the inverse, a demon has him, never occurs. Never occurs. These people are demonized. Right? The point Ardell makes is significant. No Greek word for possession or ownership appears in passages to clarify or define the activity dry, described by uh, Diomonazomai. It's, it is English semantics, not the Greek lemma, which have led the, to the controversy over whether Christians can be possessed by demons. If ownership is not a workable understanding of the Greek lemma daimonizomai, uh, how should it be translated and understood? Some translators who have detected the problem caused by English semantics related to words like possess have opted for rendering such as tormented or troubled, tormented or troubled by demons. While these choices may help, there are other Greek lemmas that have these meanings, and so the choices are interpretive. They're interpreting that rather than what the words actually mean. The best alternative seems to be simply to transliterate uh, daimonizomai as demonized or demonized. This choice avoids misconceptions and related theological inconsistencies that arise from English possession semantics. This decision, of course, begs an obvious question. Does the New Testament help us understand how a Christian might be demonized? while not being owned by Satan or an evil spirit. Arnold asked the same question in other ways. We might ask, can Christians come under a high degree of influence 
by a demonic spirit? Or is it possible for Christians to yield control of their bodies to a demonic spirit in the same way that they yield to the power of sin? Heiser's answer to both of these questions is yes. My answer is yes, they can be under a high degree of influence by demonic spirit, but I do not think they can yield control of their bodies to demons. I, I do not believe that a true uh, believer in the gospel, the accurate gospel, can yield their bodies to a demonic spirit. It's different to yield to the power of the sin nature than it is to yield to an external power and let that power have control of your body. On this, new, the New Testament is clear. Several passages employ language that suggest Christians can fall under the influence of Satan and evil spirits. Note, he doesn't say, and give their bodies to the, to the demons. Paul warned Timothy about certain teachers in this regard. Quote, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some will depart from the faith, that's doctrine, by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. 1 Timothy 4.1. That those doing so were departing from the faith indicates that those Paul had in view were professing believers. Remember, there, are, there is a difference between professing believers and true believers. I'll cover that more in my comments after we finish this section. But in this regard, remember uh, what John said in his epistles. They left us because they were not really of us. For sure, these false teachers did not see what they were doing as out of step with the faith. Paul linked this behavior with the latter days as the Spirit had revealed to the prophets. In his second letter to Timothy, Paul's language was even more foreboding, instructing Timothy to gently correct such opponents so they might escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You can follow demon doctrines, the doctrine of demons uh, as a believer. The idea that believers could be captured by Satan and made servants of his will certainly fits the notion of demonization, though it lacks the bizarre physical torment of episodes in the Gospels. Again, that's because a reason why, or part of the reason why, I do not believe that, that demons inhabit the bodies of believers. I mean, he said at the beginning of this, it's impossible because we belong to God, that Christ, the Spirit, and God the Father all indwell us. How could demons cohabit our bodies with the Holy Trinity indwelling our bodies? It does not make sense. Less dramatic but equally dangerous are New Testament warnings about giving opportunity to the devil. That's what I believe these false teachers had done. And habitual, unrepentant sin. Whoever makes a practice of sin is of the devil. That doesn't mean he belongs to the devil. It means he's been influenced by the devil. While the sinful impulses that gives rise to temptation resides in the flesh, uh, the devil is nevertheless called the tempter. Yielding to temptation. That's where bait comes from. Okay. Satan is, Satan is the, is the uh, uh, proponent, the provider of bait. The sin nature is the impulse that leads us to the bait, but he provides the bait. Yielding to temptation enslaves the believer, and so such a lifestyle can rightly be construed as a kind of demonization. Aside from enslavement to sin, Satan seeks to control believers by other means, whether mental, emotional, or, as he adds, physical that I disagree with. For example, the context for Peter's familiar portrayal of Satan as a devouring lion is persecution and suffering. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering 
are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Paul's equally memorable statement that a messenger of Satan was given to him to buffet his flesh in the flesh also links suffering with demonization. Notice that the, that the demon was outside of Paul, not inside Paul. The overarching point is that while Christians cannot be owned by Satan, the, uh, an idea that derives from the unfortunate possession language, they can be demonized. Demonization can take various forms, persecution, harassment, being capt captivated by false teaching, and enslavement to sin. Persecution, harassment, captivated by false teaching, and enslavement to sin. Okay, so let's go ahead and give you my commentary on this. If you watch YouTube videos by now deceased but formerly pr uh, prominent Bible teachers, they frequently are demon caster outers. They commonly have a ministry or had a ministry of casting out demons. They, however, called everyone who came to them a Christian, a believer. But not everyone who claims to be a believer believes the gospel, the gospel of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, so no one may take credit for it. What is the gospel that so many believe? The gospel of works, which precludes one from becoming a member of the family of God, the body of Christ. They're using a kingdom gospel when the kingdom is now in suspension. So they cannot even be kingdom believers. They are just believers in a false system of religion that is pseudo-Christian. And they are extremely susceptible to demons because they believe false doctrine. They believe uh, everything uh, that they should not believe about being a Christian. And so they do become demon-possessed or demonized, and the demonization includes captivity of their bodies, indwelling of their bodies. I mean, we know that they indwell, demons indwell some people because Jesus cast them out. So they had to be inside. But it's my understanding that those who have the true gospel belief cannot be demonized. Uh, they can be, they can give place to the devil. They can give place to the doctrine of demons. They can believe the doctrine of demons, but they cannot be internally demonized. Uh, it just does not make theological sense that God will allow demons to cohabit one of his people at the same time he is cohabiting them. And we know that it is eternal, that he inhabits us because we are sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. So there is no coming and going with God. So there can't be coming and going with demons in a believer who has believed the gospel of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. If they believe the gospel of repent and be baptized, they can be demonized. I, my only experience with casting out a demon was with a lady uh, who came to one of our uh, uh, Bible studies that we were involved with. And as people were praying, some of the people in the Bible studies were in the Bible study were charismatic, and they were praying in tongues. This lady was praying in tongues, but the other man who was kind of in charge of the of the prayer meeting with me, and I both looked up and looked at each other because she was praising Baal. She was praising Baal in her in her uh, tongues. We both looked at each other and both stopped the praying and went over to her. And I asked her, when did you become a Christian? And she said, at church, when they asked if anybody wanted to speak in tongues. And I went forward and received the gift of tongues. And he said, when did you trust 
and Christ alone for your salvation. And she said, I got the gift of tongues. I didn't need to. Okay. So she thought tongues was how you became a true Christian. Well, that's not true. There are, there are spirit beings, demons, called engastromuthos demons, who are ventriloquist demons, who will inhabit people and speak in other languages, both known and unknown languages. I call them demonic languages. And uh, uh, that's what she had. And so we had to cast the demon out of her and present her with the true gospel, which hopefully she believed and, and the demons left her alone. So that's my take on it all. Um, I just can't see it being a true believer in the true gospel being demonized internally. Demonized externally? Yes. There are many Christians who follow the doctrine of demons, I believe. Some of them I've not been able to question them to see if they truly have believed the proper gospel. Uh, but uh, I assume that they have uh, because of other factors in their life, but I still can't be sure. Okay. Um, our next section, what is spiritual warfare, is a more lengthy section. Uh, yeah, about seven pages of your notes, seven to eight pages of your notes. So we're going to go ahead and take our uh, first hour break uh, and then come back and cover all of uh, Dr. Heiser's take on spiritual warfare, which uh, I believe in, uh, agree to uh, nearly wholeheartedly. There are very, very few differences in what, to, what he believes and what I believe. So let's pray. We'll take 10 minute break and come back at five after at 10 after the hour. Father Yahweh, we are grateful for your word, grateful for the opportunity to study your word in freedom and peace. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who do not have that option. We pray that their, that their uh, pressure, that their persecution, uh, that their uh, demonization externally will give them momentum in their growth to maturity in the Lord. And uh, we pray for them for that. We pray for us in our freedom and peace to not become complacent and neglect our study for growth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.